So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today, uh, Dr. Ali Amid, who is um, a relatively new faculty member at UBC. I think he, uh, he, saw, the, he saw the light and moved west. So he's, uh, he's come to us mo most immediately from the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, uh, where he uh, was leading the thalassemia and chronic transfusion service and also the thrombosis service and working uh, in the hemophilia clinic. So he's got a lot of great experience that's of, of interest to uh, the membership of the CBR and to those of you who have uh, come on to the call today. Uh, I'd like to uh, just give Ali an opportunity to give us a presentation, which sounds like a very interesting uh, conversation about hemoglobin BARTs and where it's taken him. So Ali, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and we can go ahead and get going. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to, to present here. And uh, and you're right, I just came here a month ago. You can see my office is pretty empty. <laughs> so, so, like today I was looking for some objects to put <laughs> in my my background so it's not like an absolute wife. So uh, so anyway, like it, it is a huge honor to present here. And uh, I'm going to present on uh, kind of our journey in hemoglobin Bart's hydroxytase and how much we have learned over the past five years about this patient and how exciting things has been uh, in, in this field. Um, so I'm just gonna go and share my screen. Um, okay, so, all right. So do, do you see my slides? Yes. Is it, okay, perfect. So, um, excellent. So, so I'm just gonna start from the very basics uh, about, uh, we all know hemoglobin is a fascinating protein. Uh, it's an oxygen transporter, it also transports CO2. Uh, it has been, is being synthesized or assembled in the red blood cells of all vertebrate. And also very interesting is that the non hematopoietic tissue cells, they also, some of them, they produce hemoglobin, meaning that it has probably some function in other cells other than the red blood cells. Uh, the question is whether it functions on an antioxidant or not. Uh, it also, there's a possibility that it, it plays into anti, uh, inf like a, it, it is an uh, anti-infectious, uh, it may have anti-infection uh, properties as well, but we all know this is first year medical school that it has four uh, uh, basically four subdomains, uh, two beta or beta-like globins in adults, and then two alpha globins, and then four uh, heme groups. Um, but also very interesting is that how it has evolutionary, it has evolved. We think that it was everything at the, the millions of years ago, it was one gene and it became duplicated. Uh, and then uh, it, it was some gene converse, conversion and, and um, uh, some non-reciprocal exchange uh, that they all evolved from one single gene. And uh, when you think about it, you will see that the alpha on the alpha on the alpha group inside, you see that you have two alphas. And then uh, when kind of a reciprocal to that, you have beta and delta and same thing for zeta and epsilon and gamma. Um, Genes. So, uh, so it is uh, for our talk. It is a little bit important for us to recognize that alpha genes, almost each of them, produce twenty five percent of the alpha globin that that it is required. Um, it's not exactly twenty five percent alpha one versus alpha two. They're a little bit different. For, but for the purpose of this talk, we'll, we'll talk about twenty five percent. Uh, and but in the in the beta uh, uh, side in the beta lupus most of the hemoglobin, most of the globins they come from beta gene very little comes from delta and gamma in adult life. Um, but prior to that, I think this is probably one of the most famous graphs in medicine. Uh, and as you can see, is that the alpha globins the, the switching happens very early, uh, like in in uh, in embryo. But the, in the beta, it happens uh, from, from the embryonal or fetal hemoglobin to the adult hemoglobin happens later on. Um, so 
from the pathologic perspective, it is important because you don't see the features of the beta thalassemia to be to, to, to be expressed until later, a uh, few weeks after birth. But if you are missing an alpha globin, then that problem will arise in utero uh, if it is clinically significant. So it's also interesting to know that, alpha, uh, that the thalassemia syndromes are not really because one, G, one protein is being express less. It is what happens is that the, the expression, less expression of, the, of one globin will result in an imbalance, and that imbalance is where the problem arises. It is one of the most common gene disorders, uh, monogenic disorders, um, and has huge impact, uh, both on the kind of resources of the, of the endemic areas, and those countries, most of them are in the low resource settings, and also has significant impact uh, based on the severity of it on the patients itself and their quality of life. Um, I kind of use this graph to, to teach the students of uh, the, this concept of the imbalance and balance of, uh, of the globin. In this dance hall, you will see that for you to have this Viennese dance being done nice and without any problem, uh, every, every, every the, the alpha globin and beta globins are pretty much coupled to each other and they are uh, formed as a globin. Here, as you see that the alpha globin gene locus, they're mostly just, in, they're all in, uh, expressing alpha globin, but on the beta side, if you recall, only less than 2% of them are delta, the rest are beta globin that are being expressed. And in terms of the assembly of hemoglobin, you see that most of the hemoglobins are hemoglobin A and just a little less than two and a half percent are hemoglobin A2 in the adult hemoglobin. But when we get to the beta thalassemias is when one of the genes of the beta lucas are being expressed less or none. So if you don't have these genes because of the mutation, less, light, less, less often because of the deletion, what happens is that this balance or imbalance results in uh, the need to produce more hemoglobin. And what happens is that hemoglobin A now, because there's less assembly of adult hemoglobin, the proportion of hemoglobin A2 is going to go up. And that's how we diagnose patients with thalassemia uh, trait. We do hemoglobin electrophoresis, and then we'll see that hemoglobin A2 is high. And then we, we kind of uh, we diagnose this patient to be a carrier for beta thalassemia. And in in the balance, uh, if you want to see this scheme, you'll see again what happens is that you don't have enough beta uh, globin to, to, to basically assemble hemoglobin together with the alpha. There are some alphas that are left uncoupled. Uh, so those alpha will create a, uh, a um, alpha globin cluster. Then that alpha globin cluster is uh, toxic to the membrane. And so what's going to happen is that you're going to have uh, early uh, hemolysis, but in the thalassemia trait state, really that, that is not much. So you usually just, you may have uh, just a mild uh, microcytosis, maybe some anemia, uh, and uh, but really no clinical significance. Interestingly, we think that it is, uh, this state is protective against malaria. And there are some debate whether having, uh, having thalassemia trait can protect you against heart attack uh, later on, that's to be proven. Uh, but the only thing that really matters in this patient is that we screen them and counsel, provide counseling if needed. But when we get to the thalassemia major, the problem arises when you both of your genes are affected. So you produce basically no beta globin, and uh, the body tries to to increase the hemoglobin A2, but hemoglobin A2 is uh, is is a you cannot produce more than 10% of the hemoglobin A2. So what happens is that the the, there would be a switching back to the fetal life. And uh, we diagnose this patient when the hemoglobin F is elevated. Um, depends on the severity. If it is a mild thalassemia intermediate, it may be 5%. If it is a thalassemia major, then the, almost the majority of the hemoglobin, they are, they are hemoglobin F. Back in the scheme, if you want to look at it again, you see that now there are many alpha globins that are left alone. And again, those who create these alpha globin aggregates, and there's now too much 
of the damage to the root, uh, to the to the membrane, and this patient going to go to hemolysis very early on in the in the bone marrow. They don't even have the chance to come to the situation. And if you talk to our hematopathologist colleagues, you you know they will explain to you that the the smear is really bizarre looking red blood cells. You can see all forms of abnormal looking red blood cells. And that this will lead to a significant anemia and the body will try to uh, do its best to produce more red blood cells, but it's ineffective because everything happens in the erythron in the bone marrow. So, uh, so it results in major underlying pathophysiology for beta thalassemia, which is ineffective erythropoiesis. With that, you're going to have extra medullar hematopoiesis. This patient usually have uh, very hypertrophied bones, large spleen, large livers uh, that quite, uh, quite significantly affect their quality of life. Um, and as we discussed, most of these hemoglobin are now hemoglobin F, uh, especially in beta thalassemia measures. Interestingly, uh, you, you see almost no or very little reticulocytosis in these patients because everything is ineffective. So they don't even have the time to come out of the bone marrow to the circulation. Uh, because of that, you also don't see a lot of hemolysis changes in the peripheral. So if you measure the bilirubin or LDH, they're not, they're increased, but not significantly. Similar to, for example, patient with hereditary spherocytosis. So to summarize that, uh, you'll see that there would be a reduced beta globin production. But what it means is that you're going to have free alpha globin aggregates that are not coupled with the beta globin. They will damage the red cells. And the result to three main things, low reticulocytosis, espelonomegaly, and an average hemolytic index. And this is what we talk about, the ineffective erythropoiesis part. And at the same time, even without transfusion, this patient will, will evolve to have significant iron overload. So to treat the patient with thalassemia, we, we basically do chronic transfusion. So these patients, they will come uh, and then we transfuse them every month. Uh, the idea of transfusion is that one, you will increase the hemoglobin because they're severely anemic. If you don't transfuse these patients, they hardly ever would live beyond the second decade of life. With that, you also suppress the ineffective erythropoiesis so you shrink the spleen as much as you can. Also, you will change the features of the bones and the liver as well. And at the same time, as I said, uh, you, you will reduce the size of the spleen. So uh, we use this treatment uh, transfusion strategies as per a uh, basically a, um, a federation, Thalassemia International Federation guideline, which most of the centers worldwide, they use it. And uh, historically, we have been using a pre-transfusion hemoglobin of 90 and above. Uh, we tend not to do it. Years ago, we were hyper-transfusing these patients, but then we have, we have learned that with more transfusion, the benefit is much, because not as much, but the iron overload would become now even more compli uh, complicated. So, so this is probably the best target that you can have is a pre-transfusion hemoglobin of 90 to 100 percent, under gram per liter. Um, for this, the patients, they come three to six weeks, they get transfusion. The problem with this is that they're going to be, have iron overload, and then we have to start them on iron collation. So it's a, it's a huge burden on families and patients. But if you are doing a good job to providing this care, um, and if they follow, and if resources are available, which unfortunately is not the case for most of the patients with thalassemia in their uh, areas, uh, then you, you expect a life expectancy of these patients almost close to the, to the uh, healthy individuals. So we'll switch to alpha thalassemia and um, alpha thalassemia carrier. Now I'm showing you the chromosome 16, the alpha gene Lucas. And uh, if you remember, you have a duplicated alpha genes on each chromosome. And once you have one alpha gene that is deleted, it is even less than the thalassemia uh, carrier state. If you remember, that was 50% that is not being able to produce if it is beta zero. Uh, here you have 25%. So these patients really, they don't have any hematologic features, no clinical symptoms, nothing. Uh, some people call them alpha thalassemia silent carrier, meaning that you have to do gene studies to really be able to identify them. 
Um, but if you have two genes that deletion, this would be something similar to your patients with beta thalassemia trait, which one of the two genes were missing here, two of the four genes are missing. So, so again, similar to the patient with beta thalassemia trait, you will see a microcytosis, maybe or maybe not anemia in these patients. The problem comes when now you have three genes deleted, and uh, now you are, you're missing 75% of your genes expression capability. So you're only able to produce 25%. So these pa this patients uh, that are called hemoglobin H disease, they are, uh, if you want to depict it here, um, as you can see that you make some alpha, 25% of the alpha, but the rest of your beta globins are um, basically left uncoupled. One thing that is unique here and different than the beta thalassemia is that if you recall in beta thalassemia, the alpha globins, they aggregate with each other, and they don't form a hemoglobin. In hemoglobin H disease, they're forming a hemoglobin beta-4, and that is, what's the disease name come from? Hemoglobin H. The hemoglobin Hs are a little bit unstable, so that will allow the time for the red cells to come out of the bone marrow to the circulation, but in the circulation, because they don't live as much as the, alpha, uh, as, uh, as the normal hemoglobin A, th there would be an early hemolysis. So patients with hemoglobin H quite often, they, they get diagnosed when they come with a he acute hemolytic event. Um, a lot of people misdiagnose them with G6PD deficiency uh, because that's also the same, very common in the, those areas, but you, you always have to consider hemoglobin H disease as a cause of acute hemolysis in patients that have macrocytosis. If you look at the smear, you will see that these hemoglobin H aggregates uh, under oxidative stress that they form these golf ball shaped red blood cells. Uh, uh, that is kind of a kind of diagnostic for hemoglobin H disease. So, this is the main thing that we wanted to talk, uh, and that's hemoglobin Barth's hydrophilis, and that's when you're missing all of your alpha genes. The problem here is that because they happen in utero, their expression and switching from zeta to alpha genes happen in utero, basically this is incompatible with life postnatally. So uh, most of the patients, they, uh, they die in utero if you don't offer them intrauterine transfusion. There are cases of the patients who have survived uh, without tra intrauterine transfusion. They usually either premature or when they're born, they have complications. But if you don't transfuse them intrauterine, they're, they're going to develop high drops. And that's basically because the, the hemoglobin bots, uh, which is basically gamma 4 before switching to a beta 4 later on, um, it is also a, a hemoglobin that is non-functional and severe anemia in the fetus will cause hydrospitalis. There is only 70 patients, uh, a little bit more we know of them now, but have been reported in the literature. Um, and this is actually the most common cause of hydrospitalis in Southeast Asia. So, so although I'm talking about 70 patient survivors, this is actually has huge implication for the health uh, the, the for the health systems. And also as we are improving our care and uh, some of these patients may be offered intrauterine transfusion, it is a possibility that it would be a huge burden later on and there would be an explosion of this number of this patient coming uh, in the future. Um, and with that, uh, there would be even more kind of a constraint on resources. So it is, although it is rare now, it has the potential to be a major disease later on. Um, so um, for years, however, we always, we were all treating these survivors similar to beta thalassemia patients. Like uh, we transfuse them, uh, we start transfusion in utero, not even waiting later. And, uh, but our, we followed recommendation of TIF the same as we followed the recommendation for beta thalassemia patients. Generally, we transfuse these patients for a hemoglobin of more than 90 grams per liter, and we follow the same thing. 
So that was a long introduction for, for the excitement now. And, and it all started from when I was a fellow at SickKids. And SickKids is an amazing, amazing place uh, with, with a lot of patients from lots of different parts of the world. And um, something unique in alpha thalassemia is that it is very much most of the patient, great majority of the patient, they come from Southeast Asia. So we had these four patients with hemoglobin bar side drops fetalis. They all received intrauterine transfusion. They were teenagers and they were all from Philippines. So they were friends with each other and they were coming together. Uh, so they enjoyed being together. So their transfusion was basically scheduled all of them at the same time. It just happened at the day that uh, I, I went to see them and I noticed something that I don't see in other patients with beta thalassemia. In, in all these patients, all four, they had significant splenomegaly. Um, in none of them, uh, the spleen size were reduced with years of transfusion. And that's something that if you recall, one of the objectives of the transfusion is basically to reduce the size of spleen to normal. Another thing that I saw was that they have significant reticulocytosis. And uh, again, in patients with even non-transfused patients with thalassemia, you don't see that as much reticulocytosis. And then in transfused one, you basically see none. Uh, but, uh, but these patients, they had significant reticulocytosis. None of them, they had features of ineffective erythropoiesis and all of them had that high bilirubin. So if I wanted to borrow that graph that I showed you earlier, uh, in patients with beta thalassemia, you see low reti count, they didn't have that. Uh, you see that the splenomegaly that is being suppressed by transfusion and becomes normal, they didn't have that. And also you see that they have average hemolytic index, they have a very high hemolytic index. So, uh, so basically they didn't have that. So, so th there were features that did not make sense for us because we thought that they're on transfusion, so they should be like beta thalassemia patients. The next thing that I did, I looked at the retic count and then went back. And what, I, what we saw is that we saw that the reticocytosis is actually increasing over time. Um, that was, again, something very interesting for us that, okay, so why the retic counts are increasing over time. So at that time, I had an amazing mentor, Dr. Kirby Allen, I will say that anywhere that I go. And basically she said, she always telling me, Ali, if you don't, if you're not able to explain anything, go back and look at the smear. And uh, so we went back and look at the smear and I find this smear fascinating. And uh, you can see here that the, these are the donor red blood cells and these are the, the patient's own red blood cells. And uh, you can compare to the hemoglobin H smear that I showed you, you see how dense these red cells are um, because these cells that are being produced by the bone marrow of the patients, they only, they have hemoglobin H. In patients with hemoglobin H disease, you usually only have five to maximum 30% of hemoglobin H in each red blood cells. So that was fascinating, but it was also very surprising to see that here almost the patients had equal number of its own red cells compared to the donor red cell. And that's something we don't see in thalassemia, beta thalassemia. Once we start transfusing them, you suppress the bone marrow, they don't make any, of, any more of red blood cells. So it is all the donor red cells. So a transfused patient with beta thalassemia has normal hemoglobin F like everybody else, maybe a little bit increased, but the majority of hemoglobin A. So, so that, that was interesting because clearly these patients should have a lot of hemoglobin H uh, on board. So what we did, we, we went and looked at the hemoglobin analysis. This is, this is a report of what we call capil capillary phase uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis. And as you can see, the majority of hemoglobin in this patient was hemoglobin H and hemoglobin A was the minority. And there was a little bit of the BARTs because you still make some uh, gamma four here. So, so that was very unexpected for us to see that basically these patients, most of the hemoglobin is actually hemoglobin H. So if you want to put it in perspective again, you see that here you only have beta four in the red cells of the patient. 
and that those red cells will be amenable to later hemolysis. Uh, if I want to compare that to the beta thalassemia, you will see that in beta thalassemia, you had these alpha-4 aggregates, unlike the beta-4 uh, alpha aggregates, uh, rather than the beta-4 hemoglobins here. So here you have very early hemolysis. Here you have a later hemolysis in the circulation here in the, in the beta thalassemia in the erythroid. So that was a major thing that we observed in patients in beta thalassemia, barred hydrophetalis, that was different than the beta thalassemia patients. Then put things also a little bit going back to my medical school, and that's the hemoglobin dissociation curve. This is something that I always read, but I never remembered. And, uh, and you know, I probably have failed during my <laughs> exam at the time of medical school. But, but here is kind of a fascinating graph that you see that this is the hemoglobin dissociation curve of a normal red blood cell. And this is a study that 20 years ago, they did it. And this is a patient with hemoglobin H disease, the curve. But again, just recall that this is only 5% hemoglobin H in a red blood cell in a patient with hemoglobin H disease. At that time, they predicted that if you would have had a red blood cell that only had hemoglobin H, then this would have been the dissociation curve. Meaning that basically there's, there's such a high oxygen affinity uh, for hemoglobin H that are essentially non-functional. They're attached to oxygen, they don't release the oxygen to the tissue. So uh, in a sense, this is a non-functional hemoglobin and has no physiological means into it. So if you want to put it in perspective, you see that because the hemoglobin is non-functional, it would create a tissue hypoxia. The tissue hypoxia will increase the erythropoietin and then the erythropoietin will increase the reticulocytosis through erythropoiesis. Uh, to put things in perspective here now, I want to explain why we noticed that the reticul retic counts were going up in these patients. So these patients were treated like beta thalassemia patients to, to obtain a total hemoglobin of 100 grams per liter. But because they had some hemoglobin H on board, in reality, their hemoglobin was 90 from the functional part of it. As years passed, the proportion of hemoglobin H because of an increased erythropoietin elevated. So we, we went back to actually look at the transfusion and we noticed that they, they are requiring less and less transfusion. The reason was that they are making over time more of their own red cells, but problem is that it is non-functional red cells. And uh, as we go forward, in these patients, for example, now only have 60 gram per liter of a functional hemoglobin, although you have a total hemoglobin of 100 gram per liter. So we, we thought that how we can fix that because really the physiology drives through a functional hemoglobin and the non-functional hemoglobin are not contributing to this uh, feedback between the oxygen and erythropoietin and erythropoiesis. So what we thought that if we go for a higher hemoglobin pre-transfusion, here I showed as a hemoglobin of 120, by doing that, I'm gonna keep the pre-transfusion functional hemoglobin at around 100, like beta thalassemia patients. By doing that over time, I can reduce the erythropoiesis because now you have a physiologic level of the hemoglobin all the time, so you don't need the drive for erythropoiesis, erythropoietin to go up. And then as the time goes, we're gonna shrink their need for production of their hemoglobin H. That's what we did. We started to implement a new transfusion strategy uh, on our patients. And basically rather than looking at the total hemoglobin, we looked at the functional non-hemoglobin H hemoglobin. Uh, we, can, we created a formula for that and then followed that formula, targeting that functional hemoglobin to be now reflective of what we do for beta thalassemia patients. This is the result of what we did in four patients. Uh, as you can see, almost all of their markers improved after a year of hypertransfusion. So here you see that this is the, this is the bilirubin, uh, how high it was, and then it went down. This is the LDH, another marker of hemolysis. 
Uh, this is the soluble transferring receptor, a marker of ineffective erythropoiesis. And this is also the reticulocyte count. Interestingly, although we hypertransfuse them, the retic continue to be high, meaning that probably the environment in the bone marrow, uh, in the meson, meson shimmel cell in the bone marrow, how they communicate is a little bit different and potentially there, there's something to learn later on. Um, so, so by means of hypertransfusion in these patients, we are able to partially correct their, uh, their disease process. Uh, resulting in that basically the conventional transfusion in these patients was not ideal for these patients. They, they required an aggressive transfusion strategy. But the, now the problem comes uh, that with this, you're going to have an iron overload because you're transfusing these patients more. And then that raises a question for us because in reality, the patients who were on full chronic transfusion for hemoglobin H hydrostatolase, in reality, they were as if they were thalassemia intermedia. So their hemoglobin was lower, and then they, they continue to have hemolysis as if they're not completely normalized. So we know that in um, there's a little bit different in terms of iron pattern of iron overload in uh, thalassemia intermedia versus a beta thalassemia who are on transfusion. So very quick note on the iron hemostasis. As you can see that we have learned mostly through uh, studying the hemochromatosis that what happens is that you, you eat iron, iron gets absorbed and being distributed to your tissue predominantly to erythrocyte to make red blood cells and then they would be recirculated in the body but also goes to, to, to the liver and uh, being kind of a, um, uh, stored in the liver. And that is being driven by hepcidin, which is the master regulator of iron. So what hepcidin does, it acts like a gate and it would block the, um, uh, the absorption of the, red, uh, the iron from the gut and also the redistribution of it from the reticuloendothelial system or liver to the, to the blood again. So the higher your hepcidin is, it would prevent you from absorbing iron or redistributing the iron. And then something that for, for many years, it was interesting for us, but perplexing for us was that patient with beta thalassemia intermedia, the ones who are not being transfused, some of them had no transfusion at all, they, they continue to have iron overload. And uh, there should have been a mechanism for them to absorb iron more. And for years, we really didn't know what links these things together. And very recently, a few years ago, we identified a, a protein called erythroferon that, that drives that process. So what happens is that once you have anemia and hypoxia, the erythropoietin will, will drive the erythro, uh, the, the erythropoiesis with that erythroferon is being produced and the erythroferon would suppress hepcidin and the suppression of the hepcidin would, would start to absorb iron. It seems there's an evolutionary benefit to it. And the, the body always look at the anemia as a, as a means of low iron, although not all the time is the case, uh, but because most of the evolutionary drive was driven by blood loss and iron deficiency, uh, hypoxia and, uh, and uh, anemia means to the body that I need iron. And that's the process that erythroferon goes up, suppresses the hepcidin, the gates would open and the iron would be absorbed. So realizing that these patients were hy hypoxic and they were anemic, functionally anemic, we thought that, okay, so they should have a very unique pattern of iron overload meaning that we are transfusing them. So we are bypassing the system by just transfusing iron through the red blood cells. But at the same time, because they have been hypoxic and anemic, they should have a suppressed hepcidin as well. So what we did, we look at the pattern of the iron overload. And uh, it was not surprising at that time that you see the pattern of iron overload in alpha thalassemia was very much like a pattern of iron overload in 
beta thalassemia intermediate, not transfusion dependent. So what you can see is that this is a marker of LIC. This is the true measure of the iron in the liver and the ferritin. And we have learned that in thalassemia intermedia, the ferritin to LIC ratio is much lower compared to in beta thalassemia. And that's because absorbed iron will go through the process. They don't increase the uh, uh, ferritin as much as if you just bypass the process by just giving free iron uh, into the blood. And once we started them on hypertransfusion, targeting a functional hemoglobin, we saw that this became very much like uh, the thalassemia, transfusion dependent thalassemia. This was exciting because this is really the first disease that we have explained that you, by, by both means of transfusion on iron overload and also suppressed hepcidin, uh, you contribute to iron. Um, at that time, during this retrospective study, we didn't measure the hepcidin really, but since then I've started to measure hepcidin in these patients. And indeed, the hepcidin has been suppressed. This is something that we're going to put together uh, to, to submit for publication. It is also interesting because uh, there are, we are developing uh, drugs that are basically targeting to elevate hepcidin to deal with iron overload. So, so beyond just giving the patients chelation, uh, now you, 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 there are medications that are uh, in, in development that will elevate the hepcidin by itself. Um, because this patient needs so much transfusion, uh, once we elevated their iron chelation, they actually develop some complications of the iron overload, uh, iron chelation. So I think they, this patient probably will need two modalities to deal with their iron uh, overload. So, um, so I told you all of these things that they need hypertransfusion, but the question was, okay, so how much would you need to transfuse these patients? And what we did, we looked back and really to see if we can find a cutoff for these patients that, that we can really tell them that this is, or recommend this is the, the target that you have to look. And uh, what we have looked, uh, we wanted to reduce the hemoglobin H, something like hemoglobin H disease in these patients, not 50%, close to five to 30%, which we know the hemoglobin H patients, they do well. Uh, and then same thing for a hemoglo functional hemoglobin, we wanted to, to have a good functional hemoglobin like beta thalassemia patients. What we have seen, what we have tried to find is that at what hemoglobin H level you can suppress the hemolysis, and at what functional hemo uh, hemoglobin you can suppress the ineffective erythropoiesis. And we reached to a level of 16% for hemoglobin H and a 106 gram per liter of a functional hemoglobin. When you put those things together, here the blue is that when you target hemoglobin, total hemoglobin of 120, the red is when it is 900 and 100 and, uh, 110 to 120, uh, and uh, sorry, sorry, the green. And then the red would be if it is um, under 110. And this is this is where we wanted our patients to be. So their their functional hemoglobin to be more than 106, the hemoglobin H to be less than 16 percent. And as you can see, you should have started the hemoglobin the red blood cell transfusion for a hemoglobin of 120. When you think about it, this is a little bit actually crazy because these patients, they come to me, their hemoglobin is normal, they do the CBC, the nurse will come and ask me, Ali, the CBC is normal, what do you want to do? I'll say, I want to transfuse this patient. And then they, it, it is a whole process of me trying to explain that, yes, the hemoglobin, total hemoglobin that labs measures is 120, but really the functional hemoglobin in these patients are 100. And if I leave it as is, then you re-enter re that cycle of hypoxia because of the low function of not transfusing them enough, reticulocytosis that increases over time, and then you basically you re-enter the same, same process. But in reali reality, I really recognize that when we want to transfuse someone with a normal hemoglobin so aggressively, then you're going to end up with having too much iron overload. 
So what we are looking is that we probably, what we need to do, we need to start exchange transfusions to these patients. By means of exchange transfusion, you remove the hemoglobin H as much as you can, replace it with a normal hemoglobin. By that means you, 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 you end this vicious cycle of hypoxia, erythropoiesis, making more hemoglobin H. At the same time, you keep the hemoglobin more than 100. The problem here is that you need too much blood for it. And, and uh, while we can probably do it here in Canada, most of these patients coming from Southeast Asia, there may be a huge problem. Nevertheless, these patients really probably would benefit from a transplant strategy uh, or curative strategy for them. So I have said all of those. After we have done all these studies on our very little number of patients, then we said, okay, so, so I'm explaining a totally different disease. So why don't we go back and see if we can, as a population, we can see any difference in these patients versus the beta thalassemia patients. So what we did we, we, in the Ontario, we started to look at, the, um, at the, all of the patients with alpha thalassemia major or hemoglobin bar hydrostatolase. And um, you all know better than me that, you know, Ontario is the, probably the biggest, more populous, not the biggest, I think, Quebec is biggest, uh, the more populous uh, province in Canada. Um, and there is a sizable uh, population that they are, they are coming from regions with a high, high alpha thalassemia rate, 4% of Southeast Asia, and, uh, and kind of a reasonable number of birth per annum. Um, so what we did, we basically found and I uh, collected the data of all the patients who had the genetic diagnosis of uh, hemoglobin bar hydroxytolase. Mind you, most of these patients that were terminated or they were uh, miscarried um, or they died, uh, but they had a fetal demise. Um, so we were lucky in Ontario that we have one central molecular diagnostic lab in Hamilton that all the diagnostic hemoglobinopathies, they go there and so they have a uh, really data of all of the patients. Dr. John Wei, Professor John Wei is basically, um, is running that clinic. Then we went to our, uh, again, by luck, the only center that at the time was offering intrauterine transfusion for this patient in Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Um, uh, um, and uh, we collected all the process of the patients, the one who re were referred, the one who received intrauterine transfusion, the process of it, you know, how much, how many, when uh, we collected it from uh, the Mount Sinai Hospital. Dr. Greg Ryan was uh, the main uh, um, physician for that. And also we looked at the beta thalassemia centers uh, in, this, in, 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 in the province, collected the data on all of these hemoglobin bar hydrospetalis survivors. Uh, and we used some beta thalassemia patients for comparison. So what we have seen is that we had uh, roughly four to five um, pregnancies per year diagnosed at the time. Uh, mind you, they are not all born, but just to speak to the burden of it, it is not one every 10 years. We had four to five patients every year that they had this diagnosis in Ontario, which is not an endemic area. And most of them, these are you know, the genetic terminologies uh, that I don't wanna enter, enter into it. Something that was interesting is that we found that one third of the patients, they came with hydrospetalis at the time of diagnosis, meaning that we probably have to do a better job to, to educate uh, so that the patients being picked up earlier rather than really coming with high drops, which at the time things may be late. This is summarized the 99 patients that we identified through this process. I don't go through the whole, whole things, but in the end we had nine survivors at the time that we published this study. We have two more at the time, two more now. Uh, so if we were not offering IUT for any of the patients, none of them survived. But if we were to offer IUT, uh, most of them survived. The ones who didn't survive, either they, 
there was a delay in offering IoT in them or the frequency of it was you know, not ideal. Um, either family, they didn't want to go, this is not an easy thing for, for, the, for the mother to go through, to go through the process of intrauterine transfusion. So, uh, so these are mostly like a prenatal uh, and postnatal outcomes. Basically, um, this, I don't want to go through the detail of it, but what it basically said, showed us is that if you transfuse them early on and frequent enough, they will have survival with good outcome. And if you don't, then there's a, the, if you don't offer anything, most likely they won't survive. But if you don't offer an appropriate uh, kind of uh, options, then there is a good, uh, there's a good chance that also they don't survive. So these are the things that they were reported in the previous uh, studies as well, that uh, interestingly, all of these, all of the males, they have genital urine abnormalities. We do not know why they have it. In other conditions with hydrose fetalis, we don't see this that often. Uh, but it is very unique that all of the male patients, they had uh, genital urinary abnormalities. We think the gene plays into it. Alpha globins are interesting. They're right sitting at the end of the telomeres. And they have something that is called glucose control region. And that glucose control region, when you don't have the genes, there is this hypothesis that it may regulate other genes once it doesn't regulate your, uh, your the, the, what genes that they have to uh, regulate. So, so this is something that has to be kind of, we have to learn. Uh, this, is, this is still a question for us. They also had bone deformities. This is probably just because of the hypoxia. Um, and, uh, and something that also we saw is that three of the patients, they had portal vein thrombosis. This is out of four patients that had abdominal ultrasound. So this was an interesting thing for us to find that this is much more than other patients that they come uh, in NICU with portal vein thrombosis. Then when we, when we looked at the, the long-term outcome, we knew what we proved that because we are studying transfusion in utero, unlike beta thalassemia, that you usually start transfusion, let's say in a year of age, they, when, when they were one year, they had significant oral overload compared to the beta thalassemia patients. This is important because now you have to start them earlier on iron chelation. And we know that early iron chelation, the side effect of it, we have, we have seen that it affects the joint, it affects the hearing, it affects growth. So, uh, so that, that is something that probably would have some clinical implication later on. Uh, the other thing we found that if you offer them chelation, uh, their liver iron concentration was not any different than beta thalassemia. Mind you, what we have learned is that over years, because they're making more and more of their own blood because of the continuous high erythropoiesis, uh, the need for blood transfusion was less. So the alpha thalassemia patients need lower loads of iron chelation compared to the beta because they get less red blood cell transfusion. If we wanted to think that, oh, okay, so I'm just gonna treat you based on your total hemoglobin. And the other thing that we found is that most of the patients with alpha thalassemia, they had endocrine abnormalities. Quite a lot of them, they had the bone, deform the bone health problems, uh, one of them developed very early diabetes mellitus, and uh, which which we have seen in patients with uh, with hypoxia, like in thalassemia intermedia, and poor growth very common in these patients. Here on the left, on the right, you can see the growth uh, of the alpha thalassemia patients, but the beta thalassemia patients. The the red is beta thalassemia, the the, the blue is alpha thalassemia, and this is the Z score. Um, you may ask me that. So the alpha thalassemias are from Southeast Asia, beta thalassemia, they may not. Uh, so is, does the genetics the, would play into it, but based on where they are from, once we just use the patients who are from Southeast Asia with beta thalassemia, this still applies there. So, so patients with alpha thalassemia, they were shorter than patients from Philippines with beta thalassemia, um, as well. 
Then we said, okay, so, so what we know in thalassemia intermedia, unlike thalassemia major, once you start the transfusion, now there are most of the time they're not anemic. Thalassemia intermedia, we have seen that like sickle cell disease, they're gonna have this silent ischemic infarct. So, uh, so we said, how about, and also there has been many reports in the past that the patient with hemoglobin Bart's hydrocephalus, when they are born, they're gonna have neurocognitive deficits. And what we have found in our patients is that if you do a good job in for intrauterine transfusion, they have an acceptable neurocognitive um, outcome. As you can see, most of the things are average. Uh, most of the like majority of the actually probably if you measure mine, I don't do as good as some of the some of the things. Working memory, I have zero working memory, uh, but but they they did reasonably well. But looking back, when we started to do MRI of their brain, we did indeed saw that they have silent ischemic infarcts, which is uh, which is um, more a reason more more a consequence of hypoxia. For example, in sickle cell disease, we have silent ischemic infarcts, and then we have major uh, ischemic stroke. We think that in sickle cell disease, the major ischemic strokes are mostly driven by, uh, by a large vessel problems because of hemolysis, but the little silent ischemic infarcts are hypoxic changes. Here you can see that these patients, majority of them, they had silent ischemic infarcts. You do not see that in beta thalassemia. You see that in older patients with thalassemia intermedia. But here they are fully transfused. Although we have shown that they are not doing, we have we haven't been doing what we really needed to do. So to conclude, what we have done is that we basically showed that hemoglobin Bart's hydroxyphalus is a distinct new disease. It has a new and unique pathophysiology, unlike beta thalassemia. It is, it is a disease of hemolysis with a very effective erythropoiesis. We have also showed that these patients had a higher degree of clinical complication compared to beta thalassemia major patients. Thus, I, I truly believe that a curative option for these patients should be like a, a really high priority. Also, we have shown that these patients have a unique pattern of iron overload, both us bypassing the physiologic process by transfusing them, and also by them, uh, by having a suppressed hepcidin due to hypoxia. Uh, and then um, what also we showed that they really need a kind of a hypertransfusion approach, which while we showed that it, it was associated with short-term outcome, I'm not sure if this is a hard, like a long-term solution because of, because of the complications of iron overload and also complications of the long-term iron collation. So, so I truly believe that this patient would benefit from exchange transfusion or using other medication other than collation in conjunction with collation to, to kind of to deal with their, their iron. We have started to uh, at, uh, at back at sick kids to start some exchange transfusion. Interestingly, there was just one recent publication that showed that exchange transfusion is effective and uh, possible. But the problem is again the cost of it. So moving forward, we have started a consortium uh, for patients with this to get uh, all the data throughout the world. Uh, we will start studying the quality of life. Uh, I showed you the evidence that they were not being properly transfused to begin with. And now I told you I'm gonna hyper transfuse them. Either way, I assume that their quality of life probably is not as good as beta thalassemia patients. Um, one thing that I also told you was that the patients, male patients, they had genitourinary abnormality, not in a correct process, but just physician talking to patients. Uh, this is major thing for adolescent males uh, to have um, significant hypospadias or a micropenis or things like that. It really affects their quality of life. I think we need to really clarify what would be the best way to transfuse these patients and the management of the iron. Um, the other thing is that the trans uh, transplant protocols 
one thing in the transplant in the beta thalassemia is that we take advantage of ineffective erythropoiesis to use a, 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 a reduced intensity protocol. In these patients, I doubt that the reduced intensity pro protocol will work. Uh, but nevertheless, they are mostly in, the, um, in San Francisco, they, are, they have this team that they are considering the intrauterine transplant. It is not really intrauterine transplant. It is just exposing the baby or fetus to the mom's stem cells to, to kind of a, to create a host feeling for the, for the stem cells of the mom to be later to be used for a haploidentical stem cell transplant. But that remains to be seen whether that's effective or not. Something that I think would be something interesting for the broader audience here is that uh, I told you that most of the patients uh, when we looked at, they had uh, portal vein thrombosis. Something that I'm looking and seeing in these patients is that these patients have considerably reduced protein S. And, uh, and that's from what we are learning is that protein S, you have an acquired protein S deficiency state in, uh, which can be driven by infection and hypoxia. So it makes sense that this patient has been hypoxic for so long that they have reduced protein S and what it means really in terms of their uh, thrombophilia state and whether they are at higher risk of later on thrombosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. Really interesting presentation. And uh, we have time for some questions. If you, you can either put your questions in the chat or I see Dr. Conway's got his hand up already. Hi, Amid. That was excellent. Um, thanks so much. Just two quick questions. So one was the thrombosis. Do they have other manifest ev evidence of, um, of, um, of vascular thrombosis, in particular microvascular thrombi in the central nervous system, for example? And the second question is, can you give us any um, glimpses of what's going on in terms of CRISPR-mediated correction of this um, disorder uh, using, you know, targeting hematopoietic stem cells? Yeah, so, so none of these patients, apart from portal vein thrombosis, they had any thrombosis that we could identify. And, um, and most of our, like all of our patients are children and uh, children hardly ever get any thrombosis de nouveau. Uh, so, so we haven't yet identified any clot in these patients, but in thalassemia intermedia uh, or thalassemia major, kind of, Later, adult who thrombosis is a common problem, more in thalassemia intermediate than thalassemia major. Um, this is actually giving us a guidance whether actually the same thing happens in thalassemia intermediate patients that develop thrombosis. We re really still don't know why they have so much thrombosis. Is it a part of hemolysis that plays into it uh, with being an O ex excavenging and then a kind of a tr thrombogeneity of that? Or now, should we study protein S in thalassemia intermediate patients, and if it is reduced in them as well? Um, in terms of the CRISPR study, this is such a rare disease yet, so uh, so they haven't. I don't think there have been any uh, any attempt to really look into it. It's a big chunk of the gene is missing. So so from the practicality of it, unlike beta thalassemia or sickle cell, which you have to correct one mutation. That it in sickle cell is only one mutation. I don't know how easy it is to do it in alpha thalassemia. Great, thanks, Ali. So we have some questions in the chat. Uh, someone's wondering how symptomatic the patients become with hyperviscosity symptoms with your hypertransfusion protocol. Yeah, that, so, that same person's also wondering where you get your hepcidin levels measured. Yeah. So uh, so so. Uh, so it's the second question, hepcidin measure. We, we ask one of our colleagues in the University of Toronto to do it. Uh, here, I was like a, nicely delighted to know that it is actually BC offers hepcidin on a clinical basis. So, so, uh, so I think I think that that's very delighting to know. Uh, we have patients with hemoglobin bar hydrocephalus here. I have already sent the hepcidin on that patient to see if it is low or not, uh, anxiously waiting. I'm almost certain that it's gonna be low. Um, the, in terms of the, uh, 
the hyperviscosity, we considered that. So uh, we thought that rather than giving a large volume every four weeks in these patients to prevent that hyperviscosity, uh, we, we were doing more frequent rather than high volume. So, so they were giving every three weeks of transfusion. Um, but mind you, this, this uh, thalassemia is a little bit different than sickle cell disease. We know good evidence that the hyperviscosity in sickle cell disease is associated with stroke and things like that. These patients, when we measured their post transfusion, they were 150 to 160 of hemoglobin. Uh, so, so we didn't have any symptoms of hyperviscosity post, at least clinically. Again, I don't know what it means. I don't know if it's associated with a uh, negative outcome that's to be, to be seen, but I'm the first one to say that, yes, I don't know. And it may be, and I don't know this, if, if a hypertransfusion strategy by just simple transfusion is the way to go. I truly think exchange transfusion would be the better option. Thanks. And then one more question from the chat is asking about uh, what do you anticipate in terms of alloimmunization risk if exchange transfusions are used? Yeah, so, so again, uh, in sickle cell, in beta thalassemia, we know that's, that's a big problem. So uh, we haven't had any issue yet, but that is certainly a, a possibility. But again, this is a new disease, really, and how the immunogeneity is working and everything. I, I really don't know, but there is a good possibility, especially if you are considering the exchange transfusion. So this, is, this was actually a very interesting question in the sense that whatever option that I put, you, you offered me a reason not to do it. Simple transfusion, these patients would be hypoxic, and then that's not a good thing to have. Hypertransfusion, this patient would be iron overloaded. Exchange transfusion, apart from its cost, are you increasing the rates of uh, autoantibody formation? And again, that will go back to whether two things. One is that they will probably benefit from curative option. And two is that just stepping back, is this ethical to offer an intrauterine intervention to someone to, to make them being born and now having a significant chronic disease. And, and that's, I think that's something that has been in debate for, for years really. And I have not, we have not really solved that, that issue. Great, thanks very much, Ali. I think we've got all the questions if, unless someone else has a question to ask. I have a quick question, Dana. Go right ahead, Doug. Um, Ali, I'm just curious, if you were doing exchange transfusions, what would be your, you know, your target level for your hemoglobin H? Um, how much would you like to reduce it? Yeah, so, so, so I, I think uh, if, if you recall, I showed you what really you need to achieve in hemoglobin H to stop the hemosis or the functional hemoglobin to, to suppress the bone marrow. I think that would be probably the thing that will guide us the best by what we have. So, uh, which is funny because that result was very much reciprocated in real life, meaning that we achieved it, like we, we, we reached a target of 16% hemoglobin H. And that is like hemoglobin H disease patients, you know, 5% to 25% that usually that's how much the hemoglobin H they have or their functional hemoglobin, we reached to a 106. And again, 90 to 100 was what we usually do for beta thalassemia. So if I want to, to create a exchange transfusion protocol, mind you that it, it would be probably a little bit challenging because of just reticulocytosis and higher erythropoiesis, how much you can achieve that. Uh, it would be a hemoglobin H of 15% and a hemoglobin baseline of 100. 100, 500, easy for easiness. Okay, great. I think we've uh, used up our, our time allocation here. And I just wanna say thank you again, Ali, really interesting presentation and uh, a round of applause or virtual applause, whatever we, we can do. <laughs>
So, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.